I'm a big advocate for having these two paths. So you've got your specialism, your skill set, and then you've got your managerial path. And I don't think that having a pay rise and being able to progress in your career should always translate into a management path. Mm -hmm. Hello, my fellow leaders. Welcome back to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. I'm an executive headhunter, career coach, and host of this podcast. Here we talk about how to find your calling, how to succeed in business, and how to live well. As we are heading into the holiday season, I wanted to revisit some of my favorite conversations. And this week, I revisit my conversation with Louise Howes, a leadership coach, an entrepreneur, having co-founded Riot and Rebel and leadership with Louise. In this episode, we talk about how being promoted doesn't mean you should lead and why your team is the most important thing as a leader. Louise also offers some tips on the do's and don'ts for new managers. If you're a recently promoted manager struggling to adjust to your new role or just looking for some advice on how to make your department run more smoothly, then this episode is for you. Before you start the video, I need your help. We have entered the British Podcast Awards and the Listener's Choice category is now open for voting. You can directly support our show by voting for us. Just click the link in the description, look up Anatomy of a Leader and get voting. Voting closes on the 29th of August, so get in there quick. And as always, please click that follow or subscribe button wherever you're listening. Without further ado, here is Louise. How? If you run a company and you see somebody who's very, very skilled at what they do, your kind of template thinking is, well, it needs to be a leadership position as opposed to how can we compensate that person more for the skill that they're really good at yeah. and create a different pathway to progression for them because you don't want to lose those people. I mean, they're yeah. super valuable, but they don't necessarily need to want to or good at managing people. Yeah as well exactly so for bosses for managers looking at their teams to decide who they should promote can you give any tips in terms of what to look out for yes so I think the people who are able to take a step back look at the bigger picture who will involve different team members at different points the people who can forward think they can spot issues on the horizon they'll, they'll show natural leadership tendencies leadership skills that a poss possibly a path for them however it might be that you've got two different versions so I've seen some companies it work quite well where you've got like an operational manager and then your line manager so you have both which one would look at more of the day-to-day -day work which is where maybe the very experienced technical skill set comes in and they work with them day-to-day -day on projects and workload and what they do and the quality of work but then all of the actual more person management bit comes from somebody else because that is it, because it is a different skill set it is a different job so mm. I think it's understanding what's going to work best for the company structure best for the team structure it all depends on the size of the company as well but ultimately if you're taking a very skilled person away from a five day a week job that they're doing really well over here and then putting management responsibilities on them that they're not enjoying and then maybe not very good at because it's not what they wanted, it's, it's going to affect everything. It'll affect them, it'll affect the team and it'll affect client work because they're being taken off their projects to manage the team. So it has a massive ripple effect as well that I think the instant reaction from a lot of people I see is <gasps> they want to leave. So we need to make them stay and we'll give them a pay rise and we'll promote them to manager because we need to keep them without thinking what that will look like in six months or a year's time. Mm. I think it's also normalizing a path that is not just a leadership management path for mm -hmm. somebody because I think there is this sort of not glamorization but like the only way for you to progress is to step into a leadership role as opposed to being extremely good at what you do yeah. and so I think creating more of a path for those individuals that it does not require them to be almost burdened with having to lead people I think in my perspective that I think that's where a lot of progress can be made that not everybody needs to lead yeah not everybody needs to manage uh in order to progress in their career no definitely and going back to you know those new rookie managers they've just been promoted they're about to start 
managing a new team? Like what's the biggest mistakes they make? So I think one thing I see quite often is this, they, they come in to shake things up. So there's a lot of authority building, they go in all guns blazing, to like stamp their authority, if you like, because that's what they think they need to do to get people to listen to them, for them to then you know, put their ideas out and, and get them to do things that they want them to do, because that's maybe what they think a manager should look like. And rather than them actually trying to get people to listen to them, it should be the other way around. They should be taking that time to listen to their team because that is where all the answers are going to lie over the next six, 12 months, two years, whatever it be. That's where all that knowledge is. So that that's probably the biggest mistake I see mm. people doing. There's no trust built there. What they're doing is just alienating themselves from their team. They're building a barrier from day one. And it's very, very hard then to start taking those bricks down. Mm. Because it's they like it's, it's ego working. driven and it's about yeah. I should know it all. Yeah. And hence, that's why people will listen to me, as in like you hold all of the cards in terms of like, I need to be able to know everything that's going on. So that way, I will get the sort of, you know, the natural authority to to kind of tell people what to do. Yeah, mm. that's exactly it. And I used to think I should know all the answers mm. when I was a new manager. Like, that's what I'd been given the job for. That's what I'd been promoted for. That's why I'd had a pay rise. I needed to know all the answers because... That was what a manager did, right? And if I didn't know the answer to something, I'd feel like I'd have to maybe just like try and improvise a little bit to show I still knew what I was doing or I'd panic, you know, I'd think, oh my word, someone's going to realise that actually I've got no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm going to get fired. I'm going to lose the house. I'm not going to be able to pay the bills. And then you spiral really easily. Mm-hmm. And actually it took time to realise that no one is actually expecting me to have all of the answers. Mm-hmm. And... I shouldn't have all of the answers. That's why I'm still part of a team. And I think that's another thing I see managers do is they, especially if they prom- promoted from within, so if they were already in the company rather than coming from outside, they feel that they have to elevate themselves above the team, mm-hmm. which, which, yes, hierarchically, on a st- old-fashioned structure, we might have that on in drawing, but actually you're still very much part of that team. So it, it's about understanding the new role within it rather than over it. It's that expert thinking. It's if you were an expert in a domain and then you are given leadership responsibility, it's almost like you, that that expert thinking means that you have to be an expert in everything that all the other people are doing. Whereas actually, and I don't know if you find this, especially within the tech space or, you know, as we get into more technology AI, there's a lot of experts that are on the team and not one leader can be an expert in one or all of those areas. Mm -hmm. So actually their job is to tap into the knowledge of those individuals, make them work as a team make them work as a team, like <laughs> create the environment yeah. and the right support structures that they collaborate and perform as a team and to provide that leadership to them as opposed to being an expert in all of them. So I feel like in the workspace, how the structures are created is changing because of the fact that there are many, many experts being led by a person who may not be an expert in any of those areas. Yeah, for sure. So like, as my career evolved, I led teams of developers usually or project managers. I I didn't code anymore. I didn't know the best way to develop something. Like that was what the team were there for. That's, you know, that was their expertise. That was their knowledge. That was their skill. So mm-hmm. it was knowing when to tap into people's opinions, to people's ideas at different times to actually really get the best out of them. And what I mean, I'm a massive fan of something called team norms, um, which is, if you've not heard of it, is where you sort of write your own guidebook for the team. And you do this together as a team. And that allows everybody to actually get that collaboration, that way of working together. Um, Something I could could talk about the whole podcast probably about that. (laughs) Because it's something I'm really a big fan of and I've just seen work so well in actually building what you say, that collaborative area for them to work and you as the leader and manager facilitating Mm -hmm. that with the team so break it down how does that work like how do you sit down and do that as a team so with team norms you would not it's not something the manager makes on their own 
So you have to do it with the team. It has to come from the team because it needs to buy in from the team. It works really well in places that are going through maybe a lot of change or if there's a little bit of toxicity in the workplace as well, where things are just starting to, you know, niggle at the edges. But in essence, we do is you work with your team to actually write a guidebook, rule book, playbook, whatever you want to call it, on how you'll work together. Mm-hmm. So what I try and explain to other managers is we have to remember that people are not job descriptions. Like we might have eight developers or eight project managers all have the same job title. And they've all applied for the same job description when we've advertised it, but they're very, very different. And these people didn't choose to spend eight hours a day together. They chose a job that either paid well or it's got great clients or it's close to them, whatever it be, whatever their reason for picking it. What they didn't pick was the team that came with it. That that just came along and you walk in on day one and that's what you're given, right? So that's the unknown when you join a company. And expecting those teams to just work together and be high performing doesn't doesn't work Mm -hmm. so we have to actually write that playbook of how we will work together so in there you can include anything you want whatever you need to for your teams every company's different every team's different so things that I would always recommend are in there of how are you going to communicate with each other so some places I've worked love slack or love email or they're all about video calls well it's like well which one's going to work for us as a team because you've all come from different places from with different ways of working what will work for us now together how will you work with clients how will you work on projects what about if you disagree with something on a project how are you going to raise that because what I often find is when there's tension and conflict the manager becomes the middle person because they think they should do because they're there to build the harmonious team and you get team member A complaining about team member B, and rather than talking to team member B about that issue and solving it between them, they come straight to the manager. Because it's like the judge. Exactly. They don't want to be the person who delivers the bad news. They don't want to risk not being liked, mm-hmm. um, but it's okay for you to do that as the manager. So the manager gets the, the brunt of it, if you like. They get put in the middle of it. But with team norms, you actually talk about that stuff. You talk about, okay, well, what happens if on this project you disagree with something or somebody says something that you don't like how how are you going to deal with it what's the way that is acceptable that we agree as a team to do this is it actually it's a really safe space and you just call it out online in the meeting or if you're in a physical meeting room you just call it out and we're all okay with that because we've agreed we're okay with that but if not then how do we deal with that is it a private message afterwards and then we jump on a video call And some of that sounds really, really simple. But unless you actually agree as a team, no one really knows where they are with it. There's Mm -hmm. no, there's no, there's no anchor for them to be like, oh, by the way, this is how we would deal with this. And then when you get new people come in and you're onboarding, you go, okay, if you have this, this is how we deal with this. So you've got, it's like playing a game with no rule book otherwise. Yeah. Everybody just sort of makes up the rules and has a go at what they think is right. It's a, fr- it's a framework for dealing yeah. with issues and saying, well, this is, as a group, we've decided that this is the best way for us to kind of like manage conflict and have these conversations. Yeah. Um, there was somebody on the show, um, Grace, who is an Olympic medalist in rowing. Yeah. And what's really interesting is because they it's a team sport and they also having to deal with each other's differences, each other's, you know, dark sides or, you know, different individuals respond to different things in a different way. Yeah. And so they having amongst themselves also to, to say, well, in this scenario, when we were rowing and you did x you know this is what has happened to us but in the next instance you know when the same thing is going to happen this is how we're going to react to it so there's a lot of parallels between rowing a boat I mean the proverbial kind of being in the same boat together right (laughs) yeah Um, absolutely for those people who are listening who are interested in in this where can they go and find out about using this framework to, to create norman team norms team norm yeah so it, there is, I've got a load of advice actually on my, on my Instagram page about Team Norms and I like to talk about a little bit and I've got a feature length presentation on it too which I can send to people if they're interested mm-hmm. but it is about finding what is right for your team 
so what works for one doesn't always work for another and yeah you can have very small things you can have very big things on that mm-hmm. but I would definitely say communication conflict and behavioral values are something that should they're like the three golden ones I should would say we should be on anybody's team norms for sure you've been listening to anatomy of a leader with me maria vorostovsky if you love listening to these inspiring leadership stories from all walks of life and would like to support our show the best thing you can do is to subscribe or follow wherever you are listening thank you so much and i'll see you in the next episode